Hey guys, I'm going to be talking about my first big failure in med school and specifically what I mean by this is this is the first time that we took a barrier exam that you need to pass and I didn't pass it and so now I'm going to a remediation process because I failed and what I'm going to do is I'm going to first talk about specifically how did I fail and then I'm going to talk about uh, you know, the ways in which I feel like the institution has failed. I'm going to focus though mostly on what I did wrong here because I don't want to make this a blame game. The buck stops with me. I didn't pass. Um, I'm just going to try to offer some areas for improvement uh, for my institution. And then finally, I'm going to talk about how it feels. Um, and I guess I can kind of start with actually how it feels. I feel bad. I feel embarrassed. I feel stupid or dumb um you know i was thinking about like you know why why do i feel bad when i fail uh and the reason is that i give it my best i gave it my best and when you're told that your best isn't good enough it hurts and it's not just being told that your best isn't good enough it's knowing that you did your best and your best isn't good enough and so for me, that's something that hurts a lot. And it's embarrassing to say, you know, I'm not good enough. And to really think about what to do with that. Um, you know, and, and I know right now is a time when you get all these inspirational people standing up saying, you're gonna keep fighting and you're not gonna give up and you're gonna stay positive and you're gonna come back and you're gonna give it another shot and you know, to me, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm being a bit pessimistic right now, but I'm not in a good mood. Uh, it all just kind of sounds really hollow and it feels hollow. And so that's how I feel right now. How did I fail? How did I go wrong? Um, and, you know, I think we're all great at crit criticizing ourselves. Um, I was told by the... Uh, the examiner or you know proctor however you want to call it during this test what i did wrong so basically to add some background what was this test it was uh an oski and what that means in our school is that this is basically the day when they've trained you on how to do a bunch of tests there's orthopedic tests there's neurologic tests there are um you know a bunch of subjective questions you're supposed to ask the patient you're supposed to come up with an assessment. You're supposed to educate the patient and you know what you think is wrong and how they can help treat themselves and what tests you're gonna order. Um, and so you get prepped for this. You learn a slew of neurologic and ortho tests like the Sollies, the um, Varus and Valgus force tests. You learn a bunch of other crap that you know, you basically run through the motions on the day of the test and you show to the examiner that you know how to do it. And so um, you have 18 minutes to do this in our case, and they're gonna keep making that time smaller and shorter, so you better get faster and more efficient with it. And so this was literally the first OSCE exam that I ever had, and uh, the first, I literally out of the gate was my first mistake um, because I didn't know that you could take in the door sheet that had the patient's vitals on it, I thought you were supposed to write down the patient's vitals prior to entering that room. So I spent, you know, probably about a minute or two making sure that I had understood all their vitals because that's what we had done previously in our other exams was, you know, you write down the vitals and then you start the actual encounter with the patient. But in my case, uh, you know, afterwards they're like, no, dude, you didn't need to do any of that. You could have just taken that sheet with you. Um, so that's the first part of where I made a mistake. Uh, second part, or, you know, step two here is that I didn't clean my hands. So the first thing you're supposed to do is you're supposed to find the alcohol dispenser, whatever thing in that room. You're supposed to put some on your hands. You're supposed to rub it. And then you introduce yourself in front of the patient. You're, there's, the patient's supposed to see that you're professional and that you're washing your hands before you even start the exam visit. So, you know, I understand to a lot of people they're all like yeah dude if you didn't even do that automatic fail like you know your dmv driving test should just be automatic fail um but yeah the the story continues though so stay tuned 
Um, so yeah, I didn't do that. Uh, and I basically introduced myself to the patient. That all went fine. Acquired the patient's subjective. That all went fine. You know, asked the right questions, all that stuff, fine. Um, the part that I was not fine on though was the part where you do the actual uh, orthopedic tests. And so in our OSCE, you don't know if you're going to have to examine the knee, the hip, or the ankle. Um, and so there's a lot of unknowns, so you literally have to learn all the orthopedic tests for those three areas, and each one of them has like eight different ortho tests specific for that thing. So it's just like, you know, you don't know what you're gonna do, but I tried my best to memorize the tests that I would have to do so I could at least start those tests. And so in my case, I had the knee. The way I remember knee is I have T, V, A, P, B. T is the, the Solly test. So in this case, the patient was gonna stand on their affected leg. So if they're having right knee pain, they're gonna stand on their right knee, uh, right leg, and they're gonna lift up their left leg. And they're basically gonna twist their left leg three times while their knee or their uh, right knee is fully extended. And then you're gonna have the patient slightly uh, slightly bend their knee. And then they're going to do this a few times uh, at that other angle. And again, check if you see any issues. I didn't do that second part. I just did the first part. Um, and then the next one here is the varus force and the valgus force. So that's where you tuck the patient's uh, leg into your armpit. You hold their leg here. So the legs kind of out like that. And then you're supposed to apply a uh, varus force this way. Um, and then another force the other way. And what you're doing when you do that is you're basically checking if the MCL, I'm sorry, if their uh, meniscus are intact. So if you feel excessive laxity, that would indicate um, that they have some issues. You would do that on the uh, right and left side. So I did not do that. Um, I only did one side, so failed. Uh, and then also, in addition to doing that bilaterally, you're also supposed to then do the same thing you do with the Thessaly test where from having their leg fully extended, they're supposed to introduce about 30 degrees of flexion into their knee and then you repeat this process bilaterally again. And so um, when you do that uh, bilaterally, again, I didn't do it bilaterally with the flexion, didn't do that part either. Um, that's how you would evaluate whether or not they're positive or negative positive would be if you do feel excessive laxity uh, or play. And then moving on from that, you've got anterior drawer and posterior drawer. And so this is where you're supposed to sit on the patient's foot while they're supine. And you start with the unaffected leg first or the unaffected knee. Anterior drawers, you point it towards you, testing that ACL. Posterior drawers where you push it away, testing that PCL and then you move on to the affected knee, you check that side. Um, and so I did not do that um, bilaterally, uh, I only did it unilaterally. And then uh, from there, you are supposed to move on to the uh, ballotment test. And this is where we're checking for fusions in the knee. So you basically compress the upper part of the leg and then uh, that super patellar bursa is the name of it. And then you basically press down on the patella and you're trying to see if that patella kind of acts like a little bouncy thing. If it does, that indicates that they could have an effusion in that bursa below their knee. Um, and I'm assuming you're also supposed to do that bilaterally, which I only did it unilaterally. So that's why you failed, or I failed in my case. Um, but yeah, so um, didn't do those tests. I also did not have time to do passive range of motion. Um, and that's where I am the one who, if the patient did not demonstrate full active range of motion, I'm supposed to grab the patient's leg and then see how far I can flex and extend it. So extension would be pointed up like that, flexing their leg would be doing that um, before they say they feel any discomfort. You only have to do that in one plane in our case. Um, and so because I did not do that also, that was another reason why I didn't do so hot. Um, and then finally, there's also this other thing that annoyed me, um, but it is my fault for not doing a better job at it, is that literally right before we entered the exam room to talk to our patients, they told us 
hey, there's here's this thing called um, a drape. And so you're supposed to make sure that, you know, while you're conducting this whole thing, you first undo this whole, like, it's kind of like a blanket basically. And then you just are supposed to cover the patient's private areas as they're trying to show things to you. And so I lost points for that. And I also lost points for the fact that, um, you know, I did not properly inspect or palpate the patient's hip. And I was confused and it was never clarified where the hip was. Um, so the hip is very far up uh, the side of the patient. Um, so the patient will have to, you know, pull up their underwear. Um, and so you need to ask them to like expose themselves. And while they're exposing themselves, you're supposed to put that drape in the way and you're supposed to, um, you know, have them hold it up. You're supposed to visually inspect it, palpate it, ask them if they feel any tenderness and uh, didn't do that. And so, yeah, I ran out of time. Uh, these are not things that, you know, I think I would have uh, missed had I had more time, but you know, 18 minutes goes by really fast when you're in these exam rooms. And, you know, even though it's like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> this video's not even 18 minutes yet. Uh, but, you know, I, you're writing stuff down. You're trying to remember what you forgot. Um, and I think the other key thing is that we had never been shown how to do any of this stuff prior to them just throwing us into the fire. And that's part of the reason what really frustrates me right now is that they... Like the teachers say, you're expected to do this in under 18 minutes. You're expected to type up all of your notes in under nine minutes or whatever, or 12 minutes, something, something like that. But, you know, they just have all these time limits. They're like, you need to do these eight tests. You need to do them bilaterally. And they never show you themselves doing it. So you don't really know how it should look when you're there. Like, I think if you had something to go on, it would make a lot more sense, but it doesn't. So, um... This is how I guess I learn the hard way and it's embarrassing and discouraging. Um, I, I will say that I, you know, I'm, I'm just really annoyed right now. Um, but to, to try to make sure I provide productive, constructive, positive feedback, the first place I would start here is by having the teachers of our classroom demonstrate how to do one of these things, videotape it so that we can all see that it can be done in under this many minutes and also show us how it's supposed to be done. How would a professional do this? Because I think that's part of your job as a teacher is to show kids how they're supposed to do things and not just leaving it up to them and throwing them into an exam room and expecting them to figure it out on their own. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's first thing. It's just, you know, if you're gonna tell people what your expectations are, you need to demonstrate those expectations for them. If you're the teacher, in my opinion, don't just tell people it needs to be done in under X number of minutes and then fail them for not doing it. Um, if you, when you run out of time, you're out of time. You don't get to do any more stuff in these exam rooms. That's it. And it's another thing that just really frustrates me is the fact that we're not getting anywhere near. Like I, I, I just, you know, I'm still learning how to do a lot of these techniques and they expect you to be like a pro at it. And a lot of these techniques, it just, as much as I don't like saying this, um, right now, so much of this is awkward and hollow. And, you know, I think if you ask these kids, like, why are you doing this test? They're going to give you the textbook answer of I'm testing the meniscus of the knee. And it's like, how, why, how do you know that? Like, what is it? What is a positive test even feel like? You don't know. And so you basically get all these kids who just learn how to do acting, basically. It's literally just acting and you're saying the right words and you're doing the right motions. And, you know, it's, it's just, to me, it's, it's frustrating. Um, you know, I guess the thing that people are just going to keep telling you is that that's how you become a doctor is that you just keep doing these things enough times until you get to the point where it's second nature and you know, you've done this thing so many times that you know exactly what you're looking for and it's just like clockwork. But, you know, I just think imposing ridiculous time limits on people to do a bunch of tests and conduct a subjective and, you know, all these other things in these time periods, 
when you haven't even shown them how to do it is you're just setting people up for failure. You know, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and be like, yeah, I didn't fail. Like I did fail. It's my fault. I didn't perform well enough. You know, I need to do better. It's simple. Um, but I also will say that I would appreciate it if I was in an environment where people would help me and show me how to do this with these expectations, because I don't feel that that's what we've done. Um, Another thing that is discouraging about this, logistically speaking, is that um, the way we took this exam, because it was a big exam, is that um, you know we had an assessment week and then we had a conference week. And so the whole point of the conference week was that it was a lighter load of classes and this was a week of classes where they could intentionally take you out of some classes if you had to do retakes. And so the so what was supposed to happen was that, you know, if you did have to retake this specific test, you would be notified of that during your conference week. So that during your conference week, you could be like, okay, I'm going to take, I'm going to set aside a few hours here. I'm going to go over this. I'm going to make sure I know what I'm doing. I'm going to prepare for it. And I'm going to, you know, give it another shot. And the problem is that here, uh, they did not get back to us on what our grades were until a week and a half later. So conference week had already finished. And so we're already into the next block here. We're already learning and preparing for the next midterms and finals and practicals and everything else. And so it's really not fair that the week when we were supposed to be doing these retakes, we weren't even notified that we'd have to retake it because they were dropping the ball on their end in terms of grading this stuff. And to me, what is very unfair about that is that the there are a lot of rules in medical school. One of them is when you're showing up for an OSCE exam, if you are one second late to the front door when they say, you know, students, you may enter and start your encounters, you're not getting in. If you don't have your name badge, you're not getting in. If you don't have your identification card, you're not getting in. If you don't have your white coat, you're not getting in. If you don't have your equipment, you're not getting in. So they basically have a bunch of these rules for the students to tell them, you know, you better be on time and you better be prepared. And the expectation on our end was that, you know, when you conduct your tests, you're gonna get back to us in a similarly punctual uh, fashion to what you've expected of us. And they simply haven't. They dragged their feet for a week and a half and then they got back to us a week and a half later. And now they're like, hey, you gotta retake this. And I just, I don't think that's very ethical of them on their part. It doesn't seem like it's justice to me. Justice meaning you're gonna treat everyone equally. So you're treating us one way and then you're treating yourself another, expecting us to put up with all your you know, delays and then just go through this just like everything's fine and normal. When it puts people who have to retake at a disadvantage now because they're in another block and they've got a bunch of other stuff they need to be learning right now. So that's really frustrating to me. Um, another thing that's frustrating is the fact that, uh, you know, at this particular school, we have two campuses. And so one campus has one professor for this class. Another campus has another professor or professors for this class. And they have individual policies that are different and not equal. Um, so, uh, the other campus, if you fail this exam, this exam's two parts. It's the note-taking part and it's the uh, actual encounter part. If you failed one of those, you would only have to retake the one that you failed. But in our place, you're gonna have to retake both of them. So there's a different policy on retakes. So even though I passed one of these things, I'm still gonna have to retake this whole thing, which means more time I'm gonna have to take out of preparing for this next set of courses for doing two tests instead of one. And so again, why is there a difference between which campus you go to? There shouldn't be one. So, um, I, and it's not me saying that that's unfair that I have to retake both. Um, it's me just saying, be consistent with your expectations and your policies for all students, because it's really frustrating and demoralizing to people when you've got, uh, separate but not equal. So I'm definitely feeling embarrassed and sad and bad right now. Um, 
<sighs> and yeah, so I'm gonna wrap things up with that. You know, it's definitely a long video. Uh, and if this was an SP encounter, we've exceeded 18 minutes, so I would have already failed again. <laughs> um, but I hope everyone out there is doing better than I am. And, you know, this is what it looks like in med school when you fail on the big exams. I've failed other exams in med school before, but they weren't barrier exams. So this is the first biggie, um, and it does not feel good. Uh, and, yeah, so I'm going to wrap things up with that. I will uh, I'll also conclude by saying failing is fairly common in med school. It's more common than I thought. There's a lot of other students who are in similar boats and who also have had to retake stuff. So that's what life looks like. And these are kids who are not slackers. Like everyone here is working really, really hard. And so it hurts a lot when it's not good enough. And I know that's a big theme in medicine is that your best isn't good enough all the time. As much as you'd like it to be, uh, it isn't. And so things can get pretty dark pretty fast, but hopefully people can still stay positive. Um, and I'm working on that. I'm really working hard on it. And uh, yeah. So yeah, I will uh, stop with that. Thank you all for watching. Be well.